Hey, hey, everybody, welcome to That Expert Show, where you help run the show. I'm Anna Canzano. Thanks so much for being with me tonight. We're talking about COVID mental health, so mental health during this pandemic. This really hasn't been an easy situation for anyone. It's created isolation, loneliness, brain fog for some folks. Maybe you feel more tired than normal. Um, in addition to social norms being disrupted and other mental health issues that might have been uh, bubbling under the surface that have now risen to the surface in terms of anxiety and depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. It's really been a challenging time. I want to thank Trillium Family Services for sponsoring this episode. Their mission is to build brighter futures with children and families and their vision is to create safe communities where children are healthy and every family has the opportunity for success. So along that lines, we are answering your questions right now. If you're tuning in live, feel free to tell me what you would like to know of our expert guest this evening, who is the regional medical director and lead psychiatrist in the Portland metro area for Trillium Family Services. Uh, he specializes in working with children and adolescents, but obviously has advice that the rest of us can use. Joining us live tonight is Dr. David Jeffrey. Dr. Jeffrey, Thanks for being on that expert show. Well, thanks, Anna. It's great to be here. I wanted to lead off uh, with questions that have come in from viewers, uh, people that have either written in or posted on social media. They knew they would be, uh, you know, getting them answered by an expert in the field. Uh, there was somebody that wrote in that said, I have a friend who is seriously struggling with depression and anxiety due to the isolation brought on by the pandemic. They have started having very flawed coping mechanisms, such as believing in conspiracy theories and even denying the existence of the virus altogether. Prior to the pandemic, this person was one of my best friends. I understand why this person is coping this way, but it's hard when they're behaving irrationally. What can I do to support my friend without starting an argument? And is there anything I can do? I think a lot of us can relate to this. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, if you haven't experienced this, uh, you're you're fortunate, um, you know, over the past eight months or so. Uh, when you talk to anybody who's um, struggling um, and you, you can see it and you care about them, it's about listening to them. Um, opening up the dialogue is trying to learn where what their perspective is. Where is it coming from? Um, at Trillium and through uh, utilizing the sanctuary model, we we use this uh, acronym called SELF, and it stands for safety, emotion, loss, and future. And it's a way of structuring up these types of difficult discussions and conundrums. So the emotions, that's the E. This is a nonlinear thing. It doesn't have to be done in order. But emotions, you have to acknowledge what are the emotions here, and I think you're pretty clear that it's the person's hurting. They feel lost, isolated. Um, and there's a loss, L. There's a loss of contact. We are social creatures, some of us much more than others. And some of us actually like the introverted state that is actually um, we're afforded during these times. But most people do connect. And uh, then this uh, ask is for safety. Um, what kind of safety? There's so many different kinds of safety, physical safety, psychological safety, moral safety. Um, and the F is future. So how to move uh, the discussion toward how does this person want to be? Uh, where do they, you know, what would they like to see? How would they like to see, be part of that change? Um, so that's, you know, in terms of sh structuring up, uh, helping somebody through something or helping yourself, um, that's a good kind of simple framework, safety, emotion, loss, and future. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you got to listen um, before you declare. Um, listening is good medicine. Um, when people share their emotions, it does in fact help us. 
Uh, that is a great point. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely more of a fixer. So I think mm -hmm. sometimes when people are telling me how they're feeling, I will jump right to, well, here's, you know, the solution, or I, I even might try to talk somebody out of feeling that way. But, but mm -hmm. here's why you shouldn't feel that way. Look at mm -hmm. all the upsides. And that's uh, not really ideal when I think we should all just have empathy right now for the situations mm -hmm. that we're facing. Yeah, the I mean, Oh man, you said it well. Uh, so many of us who notice things um, want to then help. Um, we we know that actually helping helps us. Altruism is the highest of 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 of, uh, of coping skills, really. And uh, and so, how do we do that out of love? Well, we do it with a compassion, knowing that this is not usually a one conversation type of thing, and that we might not get our desired change that we want to see after it may take many, many conversations of listening. Hmm. That's a great yeah. point. Um, I know that you specialize uh, in working with children and adolescents. I'm really quite concerned about the children and teens in our community. What kind of feedback are you getting uh, from clients and the struggles that they're facing and um, just about young people in our community in general? Yeah, well, I, I do work with uh, young and uh, adolescent kids, and then I work with people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and up. Um, so there are some definitely some common uh, experiences, and that part of it is the isolation, the loss of our rituals of social contact. Um, for kids, they're at a higher risk because they depend on us. Uh, they depend on adults to keep the routines going, to... Um, help them feel safe, to model uh, safety for them. Um, and so they're, they're in a particularly more dependent, you know, place. Uh, so the, uh, what I've seen is uh, with the kids who I work with, so a lot of them have, don't have, have family in the area. So that's meant uh, we've really had to work on our Zoom and other technologies to make sure that we're facilitating uh, those contacts, knowing that people have to see each other's faces. Uh, it's great to talk on the phone, but boy, it's powerful to see somebody else's face, especially somebody you care about and who cares about you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, positive childhood experiences that really can help build resiliency and help build uh, an ability to work through difficult, challenging uh, experiences throughout life. One of those childhood, positive childhood experiences, knowing that somebody, an adult really cares about you and checks in on you. Um, so a lot of, uh, a lot of kids need help with that being facilitated, you know, um, and in a creative way. You know, we have to think outside the box. Yeah, it's definitely not a one size fits all solution because kids are all so different. I am hearing <laughs> from parents of teenagers who are particularly concerned about their kids that are doing distance learning. And I mean, oh, they're yeah. literally in their rooms the entire day. They might come down for a glass of water or a snack here or there, but their sleep patterns are all screwed up. And um, they're really worried about their kids falling into depression, um, regardless of where they're, where they're at on the social spectrum and the interest in being yeah. social. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a completely unprecedented challenge for our times, right? Uh, and, yeah, there's, there are so many challenges for kids with remote school, uh, the perpetual Zoom school. Uh, I mean, I really hope we can get kids back to school. I mean, I think kids... Uh, are, are realizing also that, uh, hey, there's, they may value school a little bit more uh, when they get back there, and we will get back there. So uh, a part of our job is to reinforce, yes, this too shall end, and we will uh, be smarter, uh, ultimately stronger for it, but it's going to take some creativity. Um, we have to break up times of uh, uh, that someone's in the room and, you know, staring at a screen and uh, kids. Yeah. That I means some of the symptoms you can see with kids too spending too much time on a screen, they become more tearful. They kind of lose interest in food. They start complaining of back pain or itchy eyes, um, you know, can, it, can appear sad and be sad. 
Um, and so you want to give them a chance to, first of all, you know, express their emotions, you know, um, and then help them find ways to get routine back. Um, so a lot of schools, uh, you know, high schools, they have synchronous periods and asynchronous periods. So the synchronous periods, yeah, you got, you got to be there and encourage them to turn their video on and engage. I mean, it's uh, a, lot, a lot of there's a lot of classes out there where the teacher's got to look at a lot of blank uh, screens, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, engage, step out there uh, and um, others will follow eventually. Um but it does take a little bit of a, a push mm. from the self to get there. Some motivation. It's tough um, with teenagers too, because obviously they're teenagers, and so they want, you know, to know that they're gaining independence and the ability to make decisions for themselves. But as parents, you still can pretty clearly see, like, you need to get outside today. You need to breathe some fresh air. We need to go for a hike. So there's that tension, you know, between oh, yeah. letting the teenager make decisions for themselves, but also really seeing as a parent, like, okay, I I need to kind of intervene and almost force the kid to, to do what's healthy for them today. Well, um, there's a, um, a, the Vermont family-based uh, approach uh, came out of University of Vermont. Uh, really focuses on not the individual, like the identified patient, as, it, as the person sometimes called who walks into the clinic, but the family and building uh, family uh, goals. And that might be, you know, for one person, exercise, the other person cooking, the other person, you know, meditation, the other, another person, you know, learning how to pogo stick well, um, whatever that might be, like doing it together. So parents uh, and older siblings, you know, do well to model what they want to see. Hmm. Um, you know, little kids, middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, young adults, middle-aged folk, you know, older folk, the very old. We all need activity, right? We all need routine, but we also need breaks in the routine. So building in those breaks of routine in routine and just going outside taking a walk, you know, looking at the sky, breathing different air, like outside air, um, you know, can be really simple. I, you know, I know some kids just, you know, they go outside and they, they skate, yeah. you know, um, escape, they skateboard and they, you know, I know that that's been uh, really helpful for uh, quite a few and it could be a number of things, right? I want to thank everybody who's tuning in with us right now. Uh, this is obviously a, a topic that so many of us can relate to. Crystal wants to know, uh, what do you do with young children with ADHD and having to do um, distance learning, CDL school? Well, I, you certainly it's a challenge, right? Uh, it's a challenge for kids with significant ADHD uh, to, to be in the classroom too. Um, right. So how to break that up, how to allow for plenty of fidgets, pl you know, have them maybe sit on a, on a yoga ball or on a, a, one of those gel donuts on their seat. Uh, make sure that they have, uh, you know, ability to move around when they're working um, and making sure that they have their enough sleep, eight hours of sleep or more uh, uninterrupted in a dark space. Um, of course, one to two times awakening briefly during the night is considered normal for anybody now, but, uh, good sleep, making sure they have good food, uh, good nutritious food, uh, and have healthy snacks to, to, to munch on as they're going through, uh, making sure that you build in breaks too. And that takes some real guidance, but once they get used to it, you know, like us all, we, we, we get in a rhythm, you know? Uh, so those, those, breaks and those help, helping with, hey, what are your tasks right now and helping them break them down into smaller pieces certainly can help um, as well. Making sure that they have a stable internet connection. I mean, a lot, it can be super frustrating for kids to, you know, have a, a poor internet connection. So that can go a long way uh, if you, it, you know, um, yeah. Yep, that makes a lot, a lot of sense. Um, I, I, I feel that. I mean, I mean, we've got little ones at home, um, too. And uh, I, I think it's really hard for parents because 
um, a lot of parents are doing whatever they can to just keep their job. So they're trying to monitor the kids, you know, at various ages that are doing distance learning while also trying to keep the, you know, roof over their heads and keep food on the table. So um, I, I think, you know, stress yes. is really at an all time high for a lot of folks. <sighs> Uh, more people joining us in live, and I appreciate that. Jennifer says that she has a sister with schizophrenia and disabilities. She lives in a state-run foster home. Being inside for so long is taking a toll on her mentally and physically. What are your suggestions that may help us navigate this situation? She's not able to be with us for the holidays. It's very difficult. Um, do, does she uh, does she have access to um, be doing FaceTime? Uh, or doing a, a video sharing type of thing. Uh, I, I'm not sure. That's as much as I, I actually yeah, no. know is what I mean, Jennifer that, just, just posted. Yeah. Yeah. So trying to have a visual, a uh, visual, um, virtual uh, check-ins is really can can be helpful. I mean, I know in our own family, uh, we had a birthday party for uh, for one of our family members and. Uh, we got everybody to show up. It was really kind. And um, we all got to Zoom together. And it's like your own Brady Bunch, Partridge, whatever, you know, <laughs> old reference you want to use. But you get to see everybody's there and it's fun. And, um, you know, it's you can also if, if it's possible, I don't know whether it's possible, but go and take walks with her, um, you know, spending time even if you know you got to keep your six feet and you got to be masked and um you know trying to um visit when you can and when you can't you know doing virtual is really uh it can really it can make a difference um but the strain on 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 kids or on folks with severe and persistent mental uh illness or challenges um yeah they take more care um, they depend on us to think creatively. Um, one of the things I've been really uh, into over the past uh, few years is um, I call it the the Emerald Triangle because it was uh, this, uh, a psychologist David Emerald who came up with uh, came up with it. But uh, there's a drama triangle: persecutor, rescuer, victim, and then there's an empowerment triangle. Uh, and that's the top part of the diamond, so to speak. And that's challenger, coach, and creator. So this is a way of kind of how do you flip the di how do you flip to the upper part of the diamond? How do you get from being a victim of 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 COVID, so to speak, or pandemic or isolation, and become a creator of a new path to find ways to 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 conquer that challenge? Because it, the, the the pandemic is the challenge, right? It's a challenger. And who are we going to ask for uh, to coach us? Not to rescue us, but to coach us. So we actually build in. These are just broader, broadening our skill sets, right? Um, but we have to ask for help. And we should not be afraid to ask for help. Um, how, asking for help is human. And offering help is human. Um, and... So uh, what to do about your sister and how to help her? Um, you got to think creatively, bring in other family members to think creatively, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a tough you know, one. I mean, even if there was the ability to, you know, visit the facility and if you're not able to walk in the doors of the facility, but, you know, be at whatever distance you you are allowed to mm -hmm. be at and hold up mm -hmm. a big sign and just to let her know that, you know, you're thinking about her and that you're making um, your presence known and spending your time and energy to, to communicate that to her. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, she's got her own experience about it and you may have already talked to her about it, but, you know, asking for somebody's current experience and what it's emotionally like for them is 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 a powerful thing yeah. um active listening is powerful uh jason had a question that he posted on facebook uh he said why do some people continue to ignore safety protocols despite actually getting covid and why do people like me isolate to the extreme and not leave the house ever, even to the deterioration of my own mental and physical health? 
Uh, well, I greatly appreciate uh, his honesty. Uh, and a, that's a, certainly a, a strength of, uh, of all of us to say where our uh, vulnerability is. Um, but to not stick there, but to try to move and help ourselves. Um, so yeah, it's a challenge to get out when you are concerned about either, you know, of, of, of contracting it or passing it on. Um, but what is it? Why, why is it that we have such a spectrum, right? Of, of responses, uh, and vehemently, uh, you know, believed in, uh, responses and uh that's of course natural right there's people respond to everything and uh in a big spectrum of ways so all of us have some work to do to kind of move towards the the center and to listen to each other because usually the answer is in the middle (laughs) somewhere in the middle it's not to totally isolate and avoid any human contact and to you know take baths and some sort of antiseptic wash every, every five minutes. And then some things just, that's not you perhaps, <laughs> but it's, I'm just using it as an example, uh, extreme example. And then there's the other person who's just like, yeah, they just don't believe. They think it's a whole, it's, it's a hoax, you know? Um, so how do we, how do we meet in the middle? Well, it's probably going to be through listening to the other's concerns and getting to uh, see what they would what do they think would be possible for them? What would they like to see? How would they, I mean, what can they do to make that happen? Um, and we all need to be, we need to be compassionate to others, but we have to be compassionate for ourselves. Uh, staying inside all the time or staying in your room all the time or, you know, refusing to, to watch anything else but Netflix. Um, you know, is, uh, is not compassionate to yourself. You got to get yourself, you got to take care of all your needs, which is being outside and seeing nature and being in nature. Fortunately, we live in an incredible state um, that has so many climates to experience. And we need to be outside. We need to move our bodies. We need to it, exercise is greatly involved in protecting our brains from the all these uh, attacks from whatever it might be, uh, these stressors that are part of growing and living, uh, but can break us down if we don't keep ourselves healthy, sleeping enough, exercising enough, eating nutritional, good nutrition, um, and talking with people however way we can that's safe. Uh, it's so counterintuitive, yeah. though, because in this climate that we're in, sometimes on many days, the thing that you really should do is the thing that you least feel like doing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, a typical doctor, you know, it's like, well, you need to do this and this and this, but I haven't done it in th- 30 years. But uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, for me, I had to, like my example is I had to force myself away from my computer and go running today. I had to do it. I had to. I knew I had to. I'm like, I don't have time. I don't have time. And I just did it. Um, and I went a little shorter than I, you know, wanted to ultimately, uh, just because I knew I had less time, but still I did it and I felt a lot better for it. Hmm. And my energy was better. My focus was better. Um, I don't like to go to bed. I like to stay up late, you know, um, trying to adjust that, um, you know, is a challenge for me. Uh, but I've been trying to, you know, and we, we all have our challenges, but we have to, you know, none of us are perfect. Nobody's, I mean. There's a few people that are really close, but, <laughs> but most of us are not. Yeah. Well, I have the saying in our household that there is no such thing as really um, perfection, except for, you know, for us, for God, if uh, you mm-hmm. have believe in a higher power, we just don't really mm-hmm. shoot, shoot for perfect in our household because I think perfectionism mm-hmm. is really kind of a problem in our society. Um, oh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about just the pervasiveness of the news cycle and the idea that Uh, uncertainty and death is with us every day right now. And it's down to, Mm -hmm. I I mean, I said prayers last night with our four-year-old and I always ask her, you know, what would you like to help with a prayer? And she said, I would like to pray that coronavirus goes away. She's four. It was alarming. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, it's not the first time that she's actually said that. And it's this notion that every day we're barraged with the, the death count, 
So it's 140,000 people, 150,000 mm -hmm. people. Every day we're faced with um, the certainty of death and the idea of death and the uncertainty of really when this will end, when our life will go back mm -hmm. to whatever was normal-ish. Um, how do you practice healthy mental hygiene on a daily basis, in addition to what you're saying, diet, exercise, sleep? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, uh, how do so in some ways this were this is kind of uh, we're going through the old uh, stages of, of grief, um, which is, you know, some people get stuck in denial, but and then people some get stuck in anger. You know, and, and then people are bargaining and then there's a feeling of overwhelming depression. It's never going to end. And this is it's un, it's unstoppable. And then there's a reaching of 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 acceptance um, that is quiet uh, with expectation of 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 something better with the knowledge that very difficult things are happening and there's a, a lot of people that have suffered a lot of different kinds of losses um over the past month uh, eight months you know um and will continue to but how do we you know that's uh it's those stages uh are, are real um and are natural and normal um and how to keep moving with them is uh, is one of the ways we do that is by practicing things we know and, and making routine things we know help us. Um, whether if you're, uh, if you're into, uh, a yoga, it's, it's, it's doing your yoga, doing your Tai Chi, moving your body and quieting your brain, um, through the breathing you'll be doing during yoga or Tai Chi, or maybe it's playing music or listening to music or doing art. Uh, maybe, maybe you're a 50 year old that just wants to get back into finger painting and that feels really good. So do it, go ahead. Don't feel afraid of it. Therapeutic gardening. Oh man, we have such gardeners in this town. Uh, and so biking, you know, there's so many things you could do. Try something new, you know, um, that's the way we build our, 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 our how we protect ourselves. And, and if you're a spiritual person and you believe in God, yeah, I mean, Prayer is powerful. You know, you're doing it with your four-year-old and they were actively engaging. That is beautiful. Um, you know, th through this challenge, you find a way to unite. It's scary, but it's, you're holding your strength together and we're stronger together. We're smarter together than alone, you know? Any last advice that you would offer to folks who are um, truly struggling with addiction, uh, suicidal ideations, um, really kind of mental health crises in the extremes because from everything I've read, homes that were already not safe before this are even more so now. People who were struggling with um, addiction and um, psychosis um, are in the throes of it now. Yeah. Um, yeah. what, what would you say to the folks out there who are dealing with that or maybe dealing with a loved one dealing with that? Oh, yeah. Um, these are the challenges that all of us face at some point. Um, and certainly this, we're being pushed in this direction with so many people, you know, out of work or, you know, losing their part of their job or having pay cuts or um, losing their connection, their school connection, their university connection. Um, challenges of working from home uh, can sometimes be amazingly difficult. Um, so what do we do? We, we have this increase and in, there is an increase in, um, in depression um, amid the pandemic. Uh, a re recent surveys have definitely shown an increase in depressive symptoms in young adults and as well as suicidality um, and suicidal thinking or thinking about death about 10 times in some surveys uh, increase since COVID began. Um, some of those things, obviously, they're in existence beforehand, but they've really increased in intensity. Um, so reach out to so many different things. Uh, there are a lot of psychiatrists therapists, mental health, uh, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, psychologists who 
are very interested in doing this kind of work at individual therapy and family therapy. Uh, uh, most uh, have transitioned. I think 98% of psychiatrists had uh, transitioned to doing at least some telepsychiatry, even by May uh, of this year. Um, it's an incredible, uh, it's an incredible uh, resource that you can do from home. You can do from your phone. Um, I mean, it's those are those are th- talking about what's happening is really important. It will change your mind and your life. Um, talking about things that are you fear or you're uh, uh, sad about or you're uh, feeling like life is not worth living. Those things are powerful to talk about. And don't, if you're friends with folks like that or, you know, you feel it in some of your friends, you hear it, don't be afraid to ask. Uh it can be such a uh, burden to to carry stuff like that around and not be able to share it and to be able to just say, yes, actually it was, I've been thinking about uh, my life isn't worth living is an incredibly important thing to share that burden. It's an important thing to get out. Uh, it's the beginning part of, of working with that distressing emotion hmm. and realizing I said it, but I didn't die. Um, and so th- I have, uh, I, there are so many resources. I p- made a resource sheet for folks, you know, that I'll connect to you, uh, give to you to put on the, um, well, all those sites and such that yeah. you're part of. Um, uh, there are some, uh, really great, uh, resources out there, uh, that I feel very happy about that people are stepping forward, places like the Dougie Center who deal with kids and families with grief who've lost folks who are important to them. Um, the uh, American Academy of Child Psychiatry, they have a, a lot of facts for families. They have some cool videos for uh, that are done by middle schoolers, high schoolers, and uh, college students hmm. that are really neat to, to – they really uh, – they express it in a language in a way that that age group does. You know, um, and so way better than I would say it um, for those groups. Mm, that's fantastic. Oh, we'll yeah. definitely anyway. um, include the resources uh, that you're talking about and even more that you haven't mentioned yet in our tip sheet. We create one uh, for every episode so that people Good. can reference it easily after the show. And I mean, you mentioned suicide. I have to, you know, Lines for Life and the National uh uh, suicide hotline uh, are available for text, chat, call. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and that'll we'll be in that there too. information out there too. I mean, I think the most important message that people need to hear right now, wherever it is that you're watching this or listening to this, you may feel like you are alone, but you are not. Uh, there are people who care about you. There are even strangers who care about you that you may not know about that suicide is not the answer. It is a permanent answer to what is a temporary situation. People who have attempted it in the past and actually survived it have regretted it. They talked about that moment where they had extreme regret um, and then wound up surviving it. So please do not choose that as the answer. There are alternatives available and um, you know, the folks at Trillium, there are many people in the community who are here as resources to reach out to you and to help you if you feel like you are in crisis. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Jeffrey, well, thank you so yeah. much for joining me for this episode. Um, any last thoughts before you go? Um, hold on to your hope. It's uh, It's an awesome thread that can turn into a strong rope to hold on to in these rough uh, seas of time. And, you know, reach out to, to Trillium if you've got kids uh, that you're really struggling with. Uh, we can help. Great. Thanks for being on that expert show. Oh, thanks for having me, Anna. And thank you for joining me for this episode. I hope and pray that it's helped you in some way. Um, if you feel like someone you know needs to watch this episode, please share it with them. Uh, We will put this out on our YouTube channel, also on our website, thatexpertshow.com. We put it out as a podcast as well on Apple iTunes and Google Podcasts and anywhere it is that you listen to your podcasts. 
feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would love your ideas. That's really the whole idea behind my show is that it's a two-way conversation. I love your ideas on who to interview, the topics to tackle, and what questions to ask the experts. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Anna Canzano. Um, thanks for being with me for this episode of that uh, expert show. Thanks again to Trillium Family Services for sponsoring this episode. We're here every Monday at 7 o'clock live on that expert show where you help run the show. <laughs>